I would like to welcome everybody tonight, wherever you are on the globe, uh, whether it's this time zone or another one. I hope all of you can hear me well. The webinar of today will be kind of a unique webinar, which will be mostly, of course, clinical. And this is based on my everyday experience in the office. And we will go first on the basic principles of immediate loading. And then we will continue with the new methods and instrumentation that we apply in our everyday practice. So the topic, of course, is atrophic ridge reconstruction using the Olenix protocol. Now, let's first talk just a bit about immediate loading. And we will talk about the rationale the surgical or prosthetic protocols, whether to do it flapless or computer assisted. And those are details that we have to take into consideration when we plan every, our everyday case. Now, when implantology came around, and that was on the late 70s, uh, P.I. Brennermark, which was the godfather of implantology, came out with the assumption that there are six factors for reliable OSI integration. Implant material, the design of the implant, the surface conditions, the status of the bone, the surgical technique, and the implant loading conditions. The same group of Brennermark came out 20 years later with the declaration that it seems that improvements in the surgical technique will present good prospects for improving the clinical result. And what is the improvement in our surgical technique over the years from 2004? And it came out just a decade later in 2014 when osteodensification came into the implant arena. Now, as for the OS integration concept, this is a structural and functional connection between ordered living bone and the surface of a load carrying implant without interposed soft tissue. Wow. Michael is so the clinical manifestation of OS integration is mobility. <laughs> Okay. Now, the revolution of titanium came out at the 1950s when P.I. Brennemark, which came from orthopedics, showed the condensation of trabecular bone around titanium threads as well as their integration into cortical bone. And those are the slides that were shared by P.I. Brennemark at that time. And in order for also integration to occur, there must be an absence of movement or limited micro movement between the implant and the bone in order to get also integration. And micro movements up to 150 microns were tolerated. All of us were brought to this diagram of implant placement. When we place our implant, we get primary initial stability, which is here in the top. And that primary stability decreases and goes down within three to four weeks, which is the weakest point of our immediate load implant. Then secondary implant stability, which is a biological stability, raises up and eventually they reach uh, after about eight weeks, uh, the maximum amount of uh, integration and stability. You will see later on that those diagrams are no longer valid when we talk about 
uh, immediate, immediate loading and implant placement done with different type of instrumentation. What else do we need when we go for immediate loading? We need rough surface implants that tolerate more micro movements than the equivalent smooth surfaces. And those are lots of studies that were published over the years showing the phenomena that surface roughness influences the bone density around the implant. Implant surface influences the stress transfer from the implant to the bone. And marginal bone may be influenced by implant roughness. When osteodensification came along in 2014, everything changed. To me personally, in my private practice, everything changed 180 degrees because almost everything I do today is completely different than what I've done 10 years ago and before that. And that is all because of osteodensification, which is low plastic deformation of the bone tissue. Now we have to understand we are dealing with bone, which is a unique tissue. It's a composite material of collagen molecules, mineral crystals, and ground substance, which form an extremely tough, yet lightweight, adaptive, multifunctional, and has remarkable capacity of self-repair. We know that bone is flexible to absorb the energy. It's able to change the shape without cracking. We can widen by compression. We can lengthen the bone with tension. So this is really a unique tissue we are dealing with. Now, osteodensification is a technique for implant osteotomy preparation that increases the primary implant stability by compaction and autografting of patient's autologous bone. So we are talking about low plastic deformation of bone tissue. Now, it is not a condensation procedure, as some of you might think. It is a rate-controlled compaction autografting method. That means we are autografting patient's own bone into the adjacent trabecula. And by compacting the bone, we create what we call a spring back effect, which goes back to the center and promotes the initial stability of our implant. And also the compacted bone chips act as nucleation to enhance bone formation. And it is a hydrodynamic bone preparation. So if somebody says, I can do osteodensification without using water, he doesn't really know what he's talking about. And it is a plastic expansion without bone extraction. That means we are not taking any bone out. Everything stays within the osteotome. All of us practice osteodensification almost on a regular basis without even knowing, because every extraction procedures that you do, you take your uh, forceps, you apply force into one direction, then you wait for a few seconds, you go to the other side and apply force, and then the bone starts to become plastic, the tooth comes out very easily. And that is analogically resembles osteodensification. So the main idea is to keep the bulk then we will shorten the healing time. Because every time you take your burr and you do your osteotomy, you damage the bone, and it needs about three months of remodeling and repair in order to get back to where it was before. So the bottom line, keep the bulk, you will increase the density of the bone, and of course, the stability. So we talked about primary stability and secondary stability. When we talk about mechanical stability, of course, you can undersize your implant preparation, what we have done in the past, in order to get primary stability. And then secondary stability will start to follow. And in three to four weeks, that will be our weakest point. Is there another way to do it? Well, we know that we can maintain primary stability by other means of preparation. 
and also maintain lower microbe motion tolerance. How do we do it? We will do it with osseous densification. But let's take this example here. If you take a regular standard burr, those burrs, by the way, we define them as barbaric drill bits. But when you take those, this burr, it will take the bone out and you will end up here with uh, dehiscence or fenestration, as you can see on the clinical, clinical slides here. Now, who said that extraction drilling is the standard of care? Nobody, because those drills were taken from the metal industry and from carpentry. Those are not drills that were meant to be used in bone tissue. And basically what I'm practicing today on a regular basis is osteodensification. or maintain all the bone inside and you will not extract the bone and cause damage. Now, when we take a standard drill and put it in a viscoelastic gel, as you can see on the left hand side, you will see that almost nothing happens except you burn out the gel. When you take an osseodensifying drill and you go the same in reverse, you get what we call a compression wave as you can see here on the right hand side. And that is completely a different story. So those are the drills. I'm not here to sell you the drills, of course. And you can see that there is a lot of data and literature on osteodensification and almost every month new articles come out. So when we talk about immediate loading, what is the ideal implant design? First of all, we are using tapered implants. And a tapered implant provide initial mechanical engagement or stability. And that is what we call the wedge effect. Second, we are using a roughened surface implant that will accelerate osseointegration, will enhance the secondary biological stability, and will increase the early percentage of bone titanium uh, contact. What are the criteria for immediate loading? Of course, the initial stability, and we can measure that either by period test or uh, OSTEL, and those readings are equivalent to the stability of our implant. We can, what we have done in the past, <clears throat> we did undersizing of the osteotomy. Today, we are doing osteodensification. We have, of course, to ensure a traumatic removal of the tooth. We need to place adequate number of implants and distribution for immediate loading. And of course, we have to plan the case properly. Prepare mounted casts, diagnostic wax ups, and of course, necessary radiographs. The best bone to do uh, immediate loading, of course, is bone density one to three, unless, of course, osseodensification is used, and then you can even use type four uh, bone density. As for implant length, the longer, of course, the better. Threaded implants are much better than uh, cylindrical ones. Rough implant surface, we've talked about it. Absence of uncontrolled systemic and oral diseases like uncontrolled diabetes, bruxism, heavy smokers, and so on. No inflammatory process. And of course, we have to maintain soft diet for those uh, candidates. As for a summary, the healing period should be modulated according to the bone quality and initial stability. And the physiologic threshold of micromotion is affected by the implant surface, design, and way of instrumentation. As for the prosthetic restoration, it should maintain the amount of micromotion beneath the threshold. And of course, that will maintain a, a better healing and, of course, maintenance of our implants. So, we are going to talk today about the full arch eventualism. And we will start by first showing you some 
cases. And those, this case that I picked up as the first one is one of my old cases. And you can see a lady that came into my office with an advanced periodontal disease. Uh, you can see the amount of uh, swelling, redness uh, of the tissues. You can see the flaring of the teeth. This is, of course, a neglected patient. You can also see the uh, anterior uh, overjet, which bothers the patient uh, very much. And that was due first to a skeletal uh, <clears throat> situation and also dental and flaring of the teeth because of, of the periodontal disease. So we decided here to go for the all on X or all on six in this uh, type of uh, restoration. And by the way, I'm a big opponent of the concept of all on four. I don't think that this is a concept that I, I can offer to a patient of mine, because once you lose one implant, it becomes from all on, all on four to all on the floor. And why not placing at least six implants? And that way, even if you lose one implant someday, still you can maintain the prosthetics and the function of the patient. And as you all know, the all on four concept started and developed in Portugal in order to solve the economical problems of the population. It's not because the system is better than another system. So let's get back to our patient. Here is the um, plan, which is done, of course, on a 3D software. I'm a big fan of Simplant, so those uh, plannings here were done by the uh, Simplant software. You can, of course, uh, place and plan the implants exactly where you need it. And you can place, of course, artificial teeth and abutments, so you can plan everything ahead of time. Atraumatic extractions. Here you can see the full clearance of the teeth in the upper maxilla. You can see how much, how many uh, teeth we uh, took out. And we had a prefabricated temporary that I was able to sit it and see how you can, in one shot, change the profile of the patient. Now we are sitting the surgical guide, which sits passively on the bone. I'm a big fan of bone-supported guides. I don't like the tissue-supported guide. The tooth-supported guide are quite accurate, as well as the bone-supported guides, but not the tissue ones. So we start to do our drillings, and then, of course, we are able to place the implants through the surgical guide in the exact position where we planned it. Stock abutments, filling up the void, uh, socket uh, preservation. Here it was used uh, with calcium sulfate and PRF that was placed on top. I'm also a big fan of uh, PRF, and you will see it through the entire presentation, how we utilize it almost in every case that we do. And here is the final outcome at the day of the surgery, the temporization of the patient. And you can see the difference between how, we, how she uh, got into the office and how she left the uh, surgery at the same day. And she is one of the happiest of patients. Here you can see a post-op panorex. Those are quite long implants, I think 16 millimeter in length. And after four months, we took impressions, final abutments, and final restoration. So that is a follow-up after six years. And you can see that everything is maintained. Patient is happy. She is now uh, practicing oral hygiene like a maniac. 
I mean, she's one of the best patients because she doesn't want to go back to where she was before. So let's take now another patient. That is an elderly patient. She is about 74 years old. She finally got into uh, a decision that she wants uh, fixed restoration to her upper jaw. And she has mobile teeth. Some of them are class three mobility. And the problem is also that she has two impacted canines. So that is a 74 year old lady. Teeth are hopeless in the maxilla. What can we plan for the patient in order for her to get what she was dreaming of? And that was a fixed restoration. So I was uh, examining the case. You can see here the clinical views from right and left and also the cone beam CT reconstruction. You can very nicely see where the uh, impacted canines are. And then I said, well, in order to do a fixed restoration, and I'm not going to take those uh, impacted canines out in a 74-year-old lady, because you can see according to the position of where those impacted canines are is that if I try and take them out surgically, I'm left with a big disaster, a huge defect that I will have to graft and then wait. And why not plan something which will be maybe a little bit outside the box at that time, because that case was done, I think, about eight years ago. And I said, well, we can go parallel to the impacted canines with tilted implants. And then by the aid of uh, transmucosal abutments, we can change the angulation back and do a all on six fixed restoration. So that is the plan. So easy, but we just need to think sometimes a little bit outside the box. So we plan the surgical guide and we are going to place the guide on the bone, do the drilling through the guide, insert the implants. You can see those are the uh, tapered, tough uh, implants by Norris Medical. We can also do crestal sinus elevation through the guide. And you can see here on the right, the post-op of what we have done filling up the gaps and also the uh, ext extraction sites with our biomaterial, PRF on top. And here is the temporary, temporary bridge, which is screw retained. And from where we started, we came to another way by utilizing the all on six uh, protocol for immediate loading. And you can see the follow up with the crestal sinus elevations here and the post op uh, radiograph on a CBCT. Final reconstruction, screw retained uh, PFM uh, restoration. And here, that is a five year post op of that particular patient. And I don't need to tell you that she is very happy because she got exactly what she was dreaming of. Time goes by. Here is another disaster. By the way, unfortunately, easy cases are not coming into my office. I get mostly the most difficult ones, all the ones nobody wants to touch, all the screw up cases. And this is one of them. You can see a lady here that had implants with perimplantitis. And you can actually see that most of the implants in the lower jaw have to come out. A lot of bone loss and infection. 
And basically, some of the implants have no bone support at all. So how do you plan such a case? Well, I'm sure most of you would first take out the implants, wait for healing, put some kind of a denture in the meantime, and then come back, see how much bone you have, and then plan the case. Well, we like to do it a little bit or slightly different because I'm a big believer in bone regeneration, even at the time of extraction. And even though we have some infection here, we can clean everything up. So here is our plan. We are going to take out the implants and we are going to insert here six implants in the anterior area between mantle and mantle and a couple of more implants in the back, short implants. So that is an Olonix uh, uh, concept with six implants in the front and two in the back. So here it is, we take out or take off the, the old bridge, take off the abutments, and now we start to either screw the implants out, but unfortunately, in mostly in the mandible, this is sometimes very difficult, even impossible to screw them out. And sometimes we have to use trephines in order to trephine them out. So here are the implants already out. Now we are going to um, regenerate the ridge with PRF blocks. And you can see here biomaterial. Here I think it was a mixture of allograft and xenograft and PRF. Sticky bone, you might call it. And here you can see that we placed new implants. We kept at the beginning just a couple of implants of the old one just for maintaining the temporary. We placed in the back short implants that flare inside like a pyramid here. And eventually we now have a sufficient number of implants here. And you can see here that I placed the uh, Norris uh, multi-unit abutments. Those are straight uh, multi-unit abutments. And then we take impressions at the day of the surgery by what you see here on the left, those are the closed transfers. Uh, we have plastics that snap on on those uh, um, closed transfers. We connect them all together with a material that has no shrinkage. And then we take everything out with a tray. And my lab technician, which is uh, Gustavo, I think he's in the audience tonight, uh, made me within 24 hours a screw retained temporary restoration. And you can see here the, uh, the same case three months later when we take impressions for the final reconstruction. So here it is, that is on the day of the surgery, the lower jaw. And the temporary on the left. Then we take impressions. You can see here the pre-op CBCT as opposed to the post-op CBCT with the new implants. And that is a two-year post-op of that case. And the type of reconstruction, it was a hybrid bridge and with a titanium base. Here is another Olonix that I've done in the lower jaw. Now it comes for the upper jaw. And on the upper jaw, you can see that we have a problem with sinuses in the back, but we have sufficient bone in the front. So that is what we have on the CBCT. We have lack of height in the back, but for us today, we know that when we have here, I think four or five millimeters of bone, that is sufficient to do a crest to lift. That was the old denture that that patient 
uh, go with, that is the maxilla. We open up the maxilla, expose the bone. We use our osteodensification burrs to do the osteotomies. And you can see a typical clinical appearance of an osteotomy that is done by osteodensification. We go also to the back, we do the same. And we are able now to place the implants in the front. We go further to the back to do the sinuses. And here you can see a typical subcrestal sinus orientation done with osteodensification and filled up here with a nova bone. So we fill the nova bone, we push it in in slow speed with our denser drills. And that is how we do our sinus augmentations. We measure the stability of the implants. We had phenomenal stability. So we decided to place uh, the implants and immediately load the upper six and just leave the two distal ones uh, where we didn't have a lot of high uh, or didn't have a low, uh, a lot of uh, residual bone height to load them uh, on the second stage that was four months later. And here is the uh, temporary restoration. And that is the final a couple of years later. So you can actually see uh, how we apply this principle uh, all over. 82 year old lady, she doesn't take care of her teeth. And she decided finally she wants a fixed solution. So when I look clinically, uh, you see that there is a lot of inflammation over here. There is pus coming out from here. Uh, and when you look at the comb in CT, you can actually visualize that we hardly have any bone in the posterior segments. We do have just a little bit uh, in the front, as you can see here. And on the other hand, we also have a little bit of a narrow uh, ridge. And that is the upper left, again, almost nothing. So we decided with the aid of a Simplant and my good friend uh, Gustavo, that we are going to do an immediate loading here based on six implants in the front and probably a couple of implants in the back. And I can do a sinuses there with Versa. As you can see, I almost stopped doing uh, lateral windows because they are really not necessary and I can do everything without. So that is the plan, eight implants to reconstruct the upper maxilla, full clearance, osteotomy preparation done with Versa, multi-unit abutments, PRF blocks in order to uh, veneer graft the buccal areas where the bone is quite narrow. So that is how we apply it on the buccal aspect. Closure and then taking impressions with the closed transfers and the snap-ons. And we get same day from Gustavo here, the temporary bridge that will serve the patient and that will be replaced later on, on a, with a titanium based uh, hybrid uh, bridge. So here is the hybrid bridge on the upper. And you can actually see here the uh, post-op radiograph of the upper axilla. Now she comes with the lower. And what we decided to do here in the lower to extract the anteriors, place four long implants in the front and a couple of short ones in the back on each side. So it will be here all on eight for the lower uh, mandible. 
And you can visualize very nicely here in the uh, implant planning where the nerve is, where our implants are. And everything will be accurate because we are using also a surgical guide. We are also applying the principle of green dentistry here because my best biomaterial to be used in a patient will be an autogenous uh, product. Now, I don't like to take autogenous bone because you create a lot of morbidity and you need a second surgical site. But when you have teeth that you have to extract, that is the best biomaterial to be used because it, it's autologous. It contains all the growth factors which are found in the patient's bone. And it has a huge advantage because it resolves slowly and gives a lot of time for the bone to mature. That was first shown uh, by Professor Bilderman from Tel Aviv. And we are using a small grinder to grind the teeth. And of course, we sterilize it in a special basic solution. And then we bring back the normal pH with a phosphate buffer uh, semi. So you, here you can see the teeth that were extracted in the mandible, how they are processed in our uh, little grinder. And then I'm doing the osteotomies. And again, you can see that I do the osteotomies with my osteodensifying burrs. In the back, we placed short implants as I showed you before. And now altogether we have eight implants. Here are the closed transfers, the plastic snap-ons, connecting everything with uh, the vocal material here, take impressions. And here is the beautiful temporary bridge that Gustavo prepared for me at the same day, delivered to the patient. And you can see how nice it looks both clinically and radiographically. And that's how it looks with the final in the upper and the provisional in the lower. And that is our patient. She's very happy. I think I want to start by saying... I don't know if you can hear her voice, but... So she is very happy. Again, you can take a look at the x rays here, how much uh, damage we have here to the bone. And this is a patient that I decided to go and do again the Oronix protocol. So, complete clearance. You can actually see how we do the osseodensification and osteotomy preparation. We place the implants in the lower jaw, place the uh, multi-unit abutments, the closed transfers, PRF blocks that we protect the buccal area, then take impressions. And here you can see nicely the temporization that was done in the lower jaw. Then we came to the upper jaw. And here you can see a very advanced atrophic case because it lacks bone in the back and it also lacks bone in the front because we have a very narrow ridge in the front. So you can actually see that we are missing bone almost everywhere. So my plan here was to do five implants first in the front with temporization, immediate loading, and then, of course, I'm able to do also sinuses in the back. So here is the plan. We go ahead, we open the ridge, and you can see that this is quite a narrow ridge. And here is the temporary that was fabricated on the same day. 
later on, you could see we have done also sinuses in the back, but of course we're not loaded immediately. We waited for about six months here. And then later on, we took a secondary CBCT to verify the position of the implants, the amount of bone formation, and the uh, covering of the bone all around the implants before we went to the final step. So here you can see very nicely the bone that was added all around the implants in the front here and also in the back. And then we took impressions, same uh, protocol as I showed you before. And here is the final reconstruction and the final CBCT that was done for that patient. And you remember from where we started, where we had almost zero bone in the back and a very narrow bone in the front. And when you look now on the front, you can see that we have at least three millimeters of buckle wall thickness. And that is very crucial and mandatory for long-term stability of our implants. That was the final reconstruction. You can see the uh, look of the soft tissues, how much keratinized tissue we have also by using PRF and the final reconstruction. And that was a photograph that was taken a couple of years uh, post uh, reconstruction. That is quite a recent case that came to my office. And you can see that gentleman, he's, he's about 67 years old. He's going to lose the entire dentition in the maxilla. You can actually visualize and see that he has almost lost the entire bone around the teeth. Maybe there is one or two teeth which can be saved, but that has no relevance here. So I decided here, by taking a close look, to go for the Olonix protocol in the maxilla. Now, when I look at such a case, I'm very happy. Why? Well, first of all, I like the challenges, but not just because of that. I see that there are lots of teeth that I can utilize as my main graft, my, my autograft, basically. And I can also utilize the osseodensification concept to get stable implants, and that will provide me with the ability to do immediate loaning. So you can actually see the cuts from the CBCT on the posterior segments and also in the anterior. And the plan here was to place eight implants in the maxilla and to do also a couple of sinuses with a versa in the back. So I extracted the teeth. You can actually see the lineup of the teeth waiting for me to grind them. And that's basically what we have done. We grinded the teeth, cleaned them up, we did also partial demineralization to get the uh, growth factors more available. And then we did our PRF block preparation. And now we are able to start. So we do the osteotomies. We are placing the uh, parallel pins here. And I decided to use here the cortical implants by Norris. And the advantage of the cortical implants is first that they have very good stability because of the nature of the threads of the implant, as you can see here on the right-hand side. And also, they are perfect when we are placing them in extraction sockets and we can graft the bone around the neck of those implants because the neck is narrower. So I did sinuses, as you can see here. And then I placed the uh, cortical implants. 
Then on the implants, we placed the multi-unit abutments. And of course, we utilized the versatility of the angles of the multi-unit abutments. Usually we place the angled abutments in the anterior teeth. Uh, we took impressions. And here is the temporary bridge, same day of the surgery. And you can actually see on the x-ray that we have loaded all the implants but one, the one that was with the sinus. So I decided to load it later on. So we have here seven implants that were loaded immediately uh, at the same day. Now, most of you that know me know that my main issue and my, I would say, philosophy is going outside the box. And let me show you what I mean by going outside the box. That is a lady that had eight implants and six and uh, all the anterior implants failed. And she came to me with four implants that remained in the back that were done with the sinus graft procedure. Now, when you look at the front, you can actually see here in the middle that we hardly have any bone left. So one option, of course, is to go to the old <clears throat> fashioned way and do nasal flow elevation, as we sometimes do. But here I was sitting with the x-rays and with the aid of my friend Gustavo, we came out with a concept which is completely outside the box. Why not place implants where the bone is? And that is almost perpendicular here. And then go with multi-unit abutments and fix the angulation. So actually you can see there is bone here on the right hand side, which goes straight parallel to the palate. So instead of placing the implant directly and do nose elevation, we can simply place the implant where the bone is and then go and fix it with a transmucosal abutment. So I took out the old abutments that she had for the bridge, placed uh, straight multi-unit abutments, then lifted up the flap. I also did here a little bit of nasal flow elevation, as you can see here. I set the guide, and I'm starting to drill with my pilot guide. Now, when I start to drill, you can see the angle of where our drill was, and it goes straight perpendicular here. Then we took the Versa drills and we did the osteotomy by leaving all the bone inside, not extracting the bone, of course, and that promotes also the stability. And here is the implant. This was a Norris 3.2, uh, 3.3 millimeter in diameter, placed in the anterior zone, which is almost 90 degrees here. And here is the second one. I'm checking stability, very stable. Second one, also very stable. Now we place the multi-unit abutments, and here I was using 52 degree multi-unit abutment, and here you can see the variations of the multi-units that uh, Norris Medical has, and I think they are the only ones in the market that have 52 and up to 60 degrees in uh, angulation. So now we have six implants, that of course we can immediately load, but you know, with the uh, with the food comes the 
I would say, appetite. And then I decided, well, why not placing more implants and do some nasal flow with Versa here? So I placed some graft material here, placed implants, and look at that, very stable. So I placed additional implants on both sides with a nasal flow elevation that was done from the crest, then took impressions, got the temporary restoration from uh, Gustavo, and here you can see on the right-hand side the outcome of the treatment. So we have a fixed restoration here on, I think, nine implants. Let's take and let's look at the video that was done for that patient. So here are the implants. You can see the four implants. Sorry. Okay. The old abutments. You can see the nasal rim. And that is how we do the nasal floor elevation. That is the surgical guide fabricated beforehand. Pilot drilling. Steotomy preparation. High stability. Fifty two M multi unit abutment. Thank you. 
And that is a nasal flow elevation than reversal. Some salt and pepper, PRF, we chop it to, with, to pieces, apply the liquid of the PRF, and fabricate the PRF block. Plastic snap-ons. <laughs> so that was the uh, outside the box case that I wanted to show you. And I want to co conclude with another case that was done just recently of a more, I would say, challenging uh, case. And let's take a look at uh, that case. So we are talking here about a patient <clears throat> that had no teeth for more than 10 years. Almost no bone in the maxilla. That was the plan. To engage every bit of bone. Prefabricated surgical guide <clears throat> very narrow. Mm -hmm. 
pilot drilling. and see how accurate the guide was. That is a 3.3 calf implant. Nasal floor elevation. Here I utilize that kind of biomaterial, which is made of coils. create sticky bone out of it. So we have five implants now in the front. Now we are going to do a sinus augmentation, subcrestal. That is Nova Bone. And that is a pterygoid implant. Multi unit abutments. Talking the multi units. Sticky bone on the buckle. Thank you. 
And here is the pole stop radiograph. The temporary that was done by Gustavo, same day, and in place. So I showed you some examples of what we do in our everyday practices. Here, by the way, you can see Gustavi on, Gustavo on the right-hand side in one of the projects that we have done. I would like to welcome all of you to Tel Aviv once COVID is over to our teaching <coughs> institute, which is part of the Aussie Densification Academy. We do various courses on different subjects in advanced implantology. And of course, I want to thank each one of you to uh, participating in this uh, webinar tonight. And I hope that I contributed and gave you some material to think about because for us implantologists, it's not just taking a screw and place it where the bone is. You have to think about the patient, about the prosthetics, and about the outcome of the treatment. And of course, it comes from experience, but luckily you have a lot of mentors that you can learn from. So again, I want to thank you very much for your attention. And if there are some questions, of course, I would be uh, very happy to address them, and you can pose them on the uh, chat, of course. Now, somebody asked here, I think Daniel Greenbaum, what is this oil gel? Well, I'm using here a gel which is called uh, Blue M. It is from a Dutch company and it contains oxygen, which is antibacterial. Uh, and actually, I'm using it when I place my, my multi units. And I, I know even some colleagues of mine that are also mixing it with the graph material, but I don't think it's a, a use that is um, accepted. Uh, but uh, most likely we use it uh, for uh, the abutments and also for the multi units. About uh, the tooth grinder, this is the tooth grinder from uh, Cometa Bio which is a company that was first established by Professor Binderman. It looks like a small coffee grinder, but it grinds the teeth. And it comes all together with the uh, disposable uh, chambers uh, in which you are uh, grinding the teeth. Roberto Rossi, I'm not numero uno, you are the one. Thank you very much for uh, being here with us tonight. So again, thank you very much, and I hope to see all of you very soon in the future, either here in Tel Aviv or elsewhere uh, in other parts of the world. I know that uh, uh, COVID-19 has changed the world dramatically, but I hope now with the vaccines which are coming out, that uh, things will come back to normal <clears throat> as quick as uh, it might be. So we are all waiting impatiently for those vaccines. Now, there was a question about using collagen membranes <clears throat> on the sticky bone. Well, that's a very good question. But to my opinion, if you are using a material which is slow resolving, like dentin, you don't need a collagen membrane on top. All you need is just PRF membranes, and that's all. Well, thank you all of you that are thanking me for the presentation. It was a privilege, and it was a, a, an honor for me as well to see all of you from different, part, different parts of the world. I know in some places this is probably the middle of the night, 
so I don't want to take a lot of uh, your time. And I really thank you again. And I can only promise you that uh, you will be seeing me more in the future. So really, thank you, all of you. And God bless you. And all my Jewish friends, happy Hanukkah. <laughs>